Interest in re I think it looks, it looks, looks perfect. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Mohammed. Hey. Hi. Nice to meet you. You're, you're, you're Okay, are we ready to go? All right, please have a seat. And we will begin, whoops, we will begin to uh, get rolling with our third panel today, which is enriching the brain, and that is the flip side of what our last one was about, wrenching the brain. So really, simply a different way of looking at the same issue. Um, so if the developing brain reflects the world around it, how can we avoid trauma and expose it to environments that over time result in healthy, well-adjusted children who grow into confident and capable adults? I mean, think about that. It's what we all want to see happen, right? And so what are the most basic gifts that we can give our children as their brains develop? both before and after birth. We've talked about some of these things. And how do we build on those gifts to provide them with the best environment possible as they grow up? And finally, what tools can we arm parents and societies with that help them raise emotionally stable human beings? So just a few small questions uh, that we're going to try to solve in the next hour. Uh, we have. Again, four great panelists here uh, that I will briefly introduce. Saul Sippel, got the pronunciation right, I hope. Uh, Sophie Buta, Steve Porges, and Mohammed Bikati. Thank you for coming. I was, I was going to mention before that I think probably between all of you, you've put about 50,000 miles on just to, to get here. That doesn't count the distance that you had to travel from your hotel to here, which is probably the most dangerous part of the trip. Yeah. So we're going to try to address some of these issues. And Saul, I wanted to start with you. You wrote a paper, which I love the title of, because it says, What Happens in the Brains of Very Young Children as They Learn. Uh, I always wondered after my children were born, you know, in that period before they can talk, uh, what is going on inside that little noodle? You know, and and so I was happy to see that you you wrote that article, and I love the title of it. Um, I still wonder what goes through their heads sometimes. They're in college now. <laughs> so can you can you tell us? You know, what's happening in there? Yes. Uh, thank you for this invitation. I'm delighted to be here. All the, this, all the uh, qualified professionals. Uh, in your question, you asked me uh, if this, all this uh, begins in the womb. Yes, and I agree. All this, uh, we can say that the children learn from the womb. Mm -hmm. uh, as we know, the, all this, uh, the auditory system is working from the 25th weeks of pregnancy. <coughs> then uh, the fetus, he, the fetus can hear. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know and we have this evidence uh, when the mother read a text during this the la last trimester of pregnancy to the child, when the child born, 
he, the breastfeeding is better and happy when she said the, the, the same test that she sang the, a music. That's a, a, a very good evidence. But I think reaching the brain uh, is our task and it's not easy to say in this meeting how to do this. Right. As we heard before in the previous panels, and the experience we all have working with many years in this field, there are enormous amount of knowledge in early child development. We have, we have already know a lot, and we did a lot. Mm -hmm. Then, how to go from all this news we heard Many genetic and epigenetic. It's amazing. And all things coming on. How to go from all this uh, knowledge to the practice? How to put this working uh, with children? Uh, we all, we do, not only will uh, malnourished children. We deal with well-nourished children. Uh, few of them are not at all no, or institutionalized. It. And they have families. Mm -hmm. Then, and they still have developmental problems. Right. They continue there. Then, it's a problem for us. It's not, I think uh, the priority is poverty, the priority is neglect, but we have developmental problems with the children. Mm -hmm. And you have to think the broader, uh, more broader uh, way how, how to deal with this. Right, right. As you are uh, talking about environment, uh, we know that the first, the, these first years, they are very important for child development. But environment, I think we have to precise more. Environment, uh, at that age, uh, are the parents. The children in my country, uh, until three years, 75% of them or at home with their parents. And in more developed country, no more than 40% of children have the opportunity to go to daycare centers. Then the question, and it's a, a very nice discussion, it's better to stay at home with the parents or to go to a daycare center. Consequently, in my opinion, and starting to answer the proposed question, how we're reaching the brain, the priority investment would be to offer parents the best support to understand their roles, to understand child development and needs, and how they can promote it. In other words, to enrich children's brain, we have, first of all, to enrich parentality quality, that is to offer them a basic instrumental strategy on how to cope with their children. Once they get families assistance, we start to build the basic envir environmental condition for better and healthier child development, for the brain developing uh, the correspondent neuronal circuitry from this interaction learning. And consequently, we will be enriching the autonomy, their capacity to think, developing in the most effective way their executive function. <coughs> ECD programs are fundamental. Starting in pregnancy or before, 
with appropriate design for each one. Yes. It's a, it, it, if I was a fashion professional, I would say it's not a pret-a-porter dress. We have to design each ECD program uh, to the country, to the city, to the place uh, uh -huh. that we uh, tailor, it to, to, tailor it to the society yes. you're talking about. The cultural, uh, cultural uh, way to do things and respect this, yes? Right. Uh, in the most important point, and then I, this is, meeting is, is uh, extraordinary, uh, impressive, is to keep in mind the linkage of knowledge and practical experience coming from multidisciplinary areas. Uh -huh. Yes, government and policies, corporate social responsibility of private companies' investment and their executive, the foundations, and the communities have to be invited to work together in a real and determined effort to offer the best opportunity to enrich child development with solid, multiple, and sustainable interventions. Okay. And we have evidence of this because we have programs here in the States, but not only in the States, we have programs in Mexico, we have in Colombia, we have in <coughs> Chile, uh -huh. and Cuba has a very nice program as well. Right. Then, this I think is my, uh, <coughs> what I would like to say is that the best or the great investment is to work with the parents. Okay, okay, so let's go with that. Thank you. Thanks for getting us started. Uh, and Dr. Makati, you know, you've done some, uh, you know, research. Uh, you've done some research among other areas that focuses on, you know, uh, growth of new brain cells and uh, in synapses. And, and there's something called BDNF. And uh, so I was wondering if you could explain what that is and how it affects brain development and how it might relate to enriching the brain. Uh, well, that's a problematic. Okay. <laughs> well, I think. Uh, one point is, I think the most dangerous part of the trip is coming up to the podium, so. <laughs> <laughs> so but anyway, so um, I think uh, uh, there, there are a lot of studies that have looked at that, and uh, uh, stimulating uh, uh, neuronal uh, neurons basically causes many changes, and uh, one of them, as this uh, slide shows, uh, is, uh, secretion of BDNF, and uh, uh, on the left uh, um, uh, there is, uh, 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 intra, uh, or actually on the right, there is intracellular BDNF, uh, 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 whereas on the left there is extracellular BDNF that has been secreted after stimulating uh, the neuron. And uh, uh, the, the key thing that I want to emphasize are two, uh, uh, really, two, two, two key things I want to emphasize is targeting and uh, uh, biomarkers. And the, uh, uh, there are factors that uh, affect the uh, uh, development uh, of plasticity in the brain and uh, that allows us to have uh, certain uh, windows of opportunity. And uh, in the brain, there is the neurogenesis, the migration, the synaptogenesis, and then pruning. And each one happens at a different stage uh, all of them continue to occur even into later development and even adulthood to some extent. But uh, they, are, they peak early on, most of them peak intrauterine and during infancy. And the second uh, 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 diagram shows the work of Hutton Locker from University of Chicago, very important work about synaptogenesis. And it shows different areas in the brain that peak, the number of synapses goes up, and then uh, first it is the visual cortex, then it is the auditory cortex, then it is the language areas. And as you know, pruning is you have multiple, uh, a lot of synapses that you're not using, and then you keep the ones that you use, and you, all of us lose synapses. The immature brain has many more synapses. So 
uh, and each area uh, has its peak and its uh, and, uh, 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 critical period of uh, uh, being able to consolidate function and to prune. So these four uh, uh, um, processes that I mentioned uh, happen at different stages and even within each one, like we see the pruning, each one is happening at a different stage. So if you want to have an intervention, it has to be targeted. And we understand that better in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in animals. We don't understand that very well in uh, humans, but I think we uh, uh, should be able to devise clinical studies that uh, um, uh, uh, target specific interventions for specific functions. Uh, a very simplistic way of looking at it, you, you do not want to work on uh, the, uh, a, a child's, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, highly refined motor function when they, they still are uh, two months old. You want to uh, work mm -hmm. on other stuff. So, so, so uh, uh, but what to intervene uh, uh, for and by what is a critical uh, thing. And we need to do controlled studies based on the basic science in uh, humans where we are able to target certain interventions, see the results, and use objective biomarkers, not just psychological, uh, developmental, neurological outcome measures, but also uh, uh, objective biomarkers like MRI, functional MRI, volumetric MRI, uh, because this will allow us un to understand better the effects of our interventions. And then, based on this, we should be able to uh, d uh, design large-scale interventions. And I think this is, this is a key uh, a point I'd like to make. So uh, biomarkers and targeting. And uh, just a final example from our work is where you can have, uh, uh, we worked with a hypoxia model where you can have mild hypoxia where you have later consequences. And particularly those animals are susceptible, even though they may look initially the same, susceptible to a second hit, like if they get a second hit, they, they decompensate. And some interventions uh, in the lab can prevent the consequences if you give them at the time of the insult, but some other interventions are effective if you give them after uh, as well as before. So uh, uh, even with this very uh, um, uh, kind of simplified model, you can see how uh, uh, the timing of intervention can can be effective. In our example, we used one, uh, one of the studies, erythropoietin, after the insult, and it protected them after a second hit, even though uh, before uh, the second hit, they did not look too, too different. So this is, an, uh, this is an, uh, an illustration of the principles I tried to conv uh, convey. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Third panelist. Dr. Buta, um, one of the aspects of your work that, that I think is really fascinating is that you've connected science that's related to child care, particularly uh, breastfeeding, uh, with brain development and real life outcomes. And so can you talk a little bit about what you think some of those linkages are, uh, particularly with breastfeeding or whatever other areas you think are important? So, so thank you. I mean, let me take a step back and reflect a little bit on what we heard this morning and how it links to things at scale. So I'm probably the least qualified in the room to talk about the basic science, but I do know a thing or two about evidence synthesis, its translation into policy, and then importantly, its implementation at scale. So I thought I would show you this graphic from a paper that we published a few months ago in The Lancet which made the case for investment in the, health of, in the health of women and children. And it made a simple point that investing an extra $5 per capita per year could give you nine times the benefits in terms of social and economic development over the next 20 years, by the year 2035. And if you look at the framework for these interventions, they neatly divide themselves into things that we need to do with 
families and societies, communities, things that need to target women and adolescent girls and mothers and newborns. And in this analysis, although a lot of the benefit was derived from the lives that you save, from the kind of interventions that you talk about, but there are also added benefits from investments that one derives from improvements in social and human capital. So let me turn to now where the challenge is. Now, a lot of the science that we have in this entire field is fascinating. The mechanisms are interesting. The direction of effects sometimes are in the same intuitive direction as you would expect. Sometimes they are not. And a big challenge for people in the field who deal with still six million children dying every year and close to 250,000 women dying and about two and a half million stillbirths taking place is what difference can we make to things that are on the ground today at scale in countries that have over 95% of the global burden of these mortalities and morbidities. And there are a few things that we can absolutely do. So I want to relate to two, and they both have nutrition implications, and I'm taking advantage of two of the nutrition gurus being in the room, Francesco Branca from WHO and, and Werner from UNICEF. So take the example of maternal nutrition. Isn't it interesting that it's almost 20 years since the last major study of the impact of feeding wasted women in pregnancy. Balanced energy protein supplementation for women who have the same risks as severely malnourished children. The last randomized controlled trial on this at any reasonable scale, which was just around 1,000 women, was done in Gambia in 1990. And it's as if the world has forgotten that this subgroup of women exists. And in certain geographies, the proportion of women who have the wasting equivalent of children is as high as 15%. So do we wait another 50 years to actually implement something? Or do we move in with some of the translation of what we know into policy? And then you move gears a little bit and move away from women who are actually pregnant to those who are adolescents, young girls who have the same nutrition risks. And their proportion and numbers are huge. In some parts of the world, as many know in this room, the proportion of women or young girls who have their first birth under 18 years of age is as high as 25%. We've just finished a nutrition survey of Afghanistan where we find that the proportion of women who gave birth, their first birth under 15, is about 3%. So these things are happening right under our very nose and the premise that we want to take forward is that we want to have some action on the, on the plausible and evidence-based interventions that can make a difference today that will improve the lives, brain development, growth retardation, and all the nutritional consequences tomorrow. So let me finish by breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is the low-hanging fruit. We've been talking about breastfeeding for the last 40, 50 years. Yet the sad reality globally is that rates of exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months in many key geographies are under 20%. And the pushback on exclusive breastfeeding is frequently coming from high-income countries. The actual implementation on the ground of breastfeeding programs lacks a basic attention to some of the social determinants and the frameworks around this. So it, there is no point in pushing women to breastfeed exclusively if that means in certain countries, including mine, that the only way they would do that is to give up their jobs because maternity leaves are only allowed for about six weeks postnatally. So there is a real need for us to translate some of the evidence that we already have for the benefit of interventions into policies and implementation and then obviously into monitoring. My last point is that as Jack Shonkoff and I wrote some years ago, now two years ago, there is an absolute imperative of integrating child development into our essential interventions for maternal, newborn, and child survival. Those are things that we have in our hand today. 
and we have consensus around some of those interventions across a broad swath of policy makers, agencies, and healthcare professional associations. There is nothing stopping us from putting some basic interventions in place as we build the evidence base and the science around the what and how and if and where. Thank you. All right. Steve, you're up next, and uh, your work deals so much with safety and a, a primal desire to be fear or fear fear free. Um, you know, we've seen what fear and neglect and abuse can do to children, and we've talked about it already today. But uh, how can feeling safe help a child and and make their life better, enrich their brain? Thank you. Um, can you put the slide up, please? Thank you. Um, those weren't the colors that I sent, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> but before I go into the slide, I want to kind of do a little review as well. We've uh, kind of uh, minimized some very important points. Some very important points have been made this morning, but some have been minimized. We haven't emphasized that the uh, units of the brain that are more primitive, the brain stem areas that provide portals for these higher cortical and cognitive functions to develop. We tend to be a very cognitive-centric, cortical-centric society. Mm -hmm. However, most of the problems that UNICEF happens to be interested in are problems of the brain stem. Problems that regulate the physiology. The issue, important issue is that the physiology feeds back from our body and regulates our brain stem and opens up or closes portals to higher brain function. So functionally, we have neural platforms, uh, which are really physiological states, that enable us to either be social, aggressive, or just disappear, shut down. So the important part that I really want to emphasize is that the uh, nervous system of health, growth, and restoration, which I believe is one of the primary principles underlying UNICEF's mission, is really the nervous system of the brainstem and the viscera. Mm -hmm. But that system, to work in its optimal way, has to occur in an environment of safety. And now safety, from my definition, has nothing to do with legal definitions or cultural definitions. It's a biological definition. It's whether or not the biological uh, systems, our nervous system, can detect features in the environment that enable it to be calm, to trigger certain physiological systems. Since there is no word in the behavioral sciences or in the biological sciences, we have words like sensation, we have words like perception. I had to create a word that I called neuroception, which was the nervous system's ability to evaluate risk in the environment. And that's very individual. And the problem we have is we live in a mechanistic world. And so if someone detects safety and is fine and someone else crashes and becomes hostile or passes out, we blame the person who can't function in that environment. Because we treat it as if it's a voluntary or learned behavior. And the word learning has been bantered around also this morning. And many of the properties of our nervous system are not learned. They're actually emergent properties that support different behavioral structures or different behavioral systems, which they may then be learned or modified. Right. So now if we look at this figure, what we see is that we live in an environment. The environment is really both inside our body, has features, and also outside. And our nervous system is dynamically and continuously making an evaluation. For some people, it's going to say, this is a happy world, I'm really comfortable. In others, it's going to pick up cues like low frequency sounds, like the video this morning of the bomb. Mm -hmm. And for all mammals, low frequency sounds are indicators through our evolutionary heritage of predator. We have no choice but to respond. Just as if we hear a high-pitched squeal, a scream, we have no choice but to respond, but this time, instead of running away, we look towards. So these are built into mammals. Mm -hmm. This is what we are. We have no choice. But in between those low frequencies and the high-pitched squeals are prosodic voices and they trigger our nervous system to engage and make facial uh, contact and to calm our body down. So I'm going to quickly go through this figure. And this figure really represents our phylogenetic history, our evolutionary history of our autonomic structures that promote different classes of behaviors. 
we share with the most primitive vertebrates, the jawless fish, a autonomic nervous system of a old vagal system that will shut us down. Turtles will, when there are, and many reptiles under fear, they stop breathing, they defecate, and their heart rates go slow. What happens when people fear death? They do the same thing. What happens to individuals in war zones? They respond that way. The beauty of that response system is that it can reduce our metabolic demands. However, mammals never evolved to go into that state easily or to come out of it easily. And this is the baggage of living in a violent society. People experience uh -huh. that and they don't get out of it easily. There's an autonomic circuit. It's subdiaphragmatic. And those of you who work with populations realize that many of these people have uh, disorders of the gut, disorders of uh, their entire subdiaphragm physiological systems don't work. Then we have the next autonomic structure which supports mobilization or fight flight. And this gives us the metabolic resources to get us out of dangerous situations. But if we can't get out of dangerous situations, we crash, we go down to that life threat. Uh -huh. Because the system is hierarchically organized. It uses newer structures first and then the older ones. And what is that newest structure? That newest structure is a structure of safety that links our visceral regulation of our super diaphragm, our heart and our lungs, with our facial muscles and our laryngeal uh, tone. So when we have prosodic voices, we are calm. We know from people's voices whether they are stressed, and that's not merely insight. That is linked to our biology. And the point is that when this system is working, we spontaneously engage others, we make that eye contact, we have facial expression, we have intonation in our voice, and the, the byproduct of this is it supports our homeostatic process of our body. And this is really, quote, the anti-stress. So all the discussion this morning about stress interfering with physiology is negated by creating a safe environment. And this promotes health, growth, and restoration. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm going, I'm going to follow up dir directly with what you were saying because uh, you, you were saying that safety, your definition of safety is different than yeah. other definitions of safety. And I want to understand a little more how you would define safety. Okay. And so we can go into where all these horrible events that happen in schools. And what's the response? Have the teachers carry guns? Oh. And that will make the environment safe. Well, it doesn't really make it safe because the cues are going to make the kids feel like they're under threat. Right. And so the physiology is going to be mobilized, meaning more hypervigilant, have less of an ability to be socially interactive, right. less of an ability to access certain cortical areas, and, and become, uh, in a sense, learning delayed. Uh, right, right. They're going to be more stressed, and therefore right. it's going to have right. biological but, effects but on their brain change development. change the word stress to say the body becomes mobilized and no longer calm, therefore the portals to reach these higher cortical areas, to be social, to be aware of others, or in a sense to be biologically connected, and what I really want, I want to basically give you another uh, metaphor, and that is there is a biological imperative of being a mammal, and we are a mammal, right. and that is connectedness. We need to be connected to other humans, and what I often say is other humans or an appropriate mammal, because <laughs> whether, whatever group we may have is some people feel more comfortable with their dog than they do with other people, and you have to allow them to have that flexibility. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fascinating. Do, do you see, Mama, do you see any connection between synaptogenesis and pruning and, and the sorts of things that yeah, yeah. You know, Steve mean, is talking uh, about? Uh, there, there, there are actually some, some good studies. Uh, there, are actually, uh, there are actually some good studies that have looked at that, and uh, uh, stress uh, uh, is known to decrease neurogenesis, and Vina's work showed that after stress, if you uh, put uh, the rats in an enriched environment, actually neurogenesis is enhanced. And uh, um, uh, similar studies have been done with synaptogenesis. Uh, so so uh, uh, I think this is, uh, uh, has to do with, uh, again, a, a hierarchy of uh, uh, response and... Uh, Timing. Exactly. Yeah, and, 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 and steroids, for example, that are secreted with stress are known to cause right. cell death uh, and enhance uh, programmed cell death. 
Wow, yeah. Actually, I'd like to do one follow-up. The issue of, again, stress gets us into a lot of problems because of the word. It doesn't really mean the same thing to everyone. But there's an issue of mobilization and then social engagement or the face-to-face. -face. And this occurs with mammals, and we call this play. Mm -hmm. so, so mobilization within safe environments uh, that includes social engagement are neural exercises, and I think that's where we're going. And so if you want to, in a sense, map an intervention model into any uh, psychoeducational system, and that is to have play, and play does not mean working with video games. It means face-to-face -face re re reciprocity, synchronous, and not uh, networking through the internet either. It means regulating your own bodily state with another person. And that should provide the systems or the platform for neurogenesis. So it is biological, yeah. is what you're saying. I mean, to be truly connected, it has to be one person with another person. It, it, so that, that, yeah. Back to this, to the point of uh, brain plasticity. After Dr. Mohammed, uh, what he said, he said, I see. I agree. I think that uh, brain plasticity has limits. Mm -hmm. And the brain, but the brain maybe has the capacity to learn, but not always and in a large way. Uh, I have, uh, uh, we have the uh, experience in Brazil when we did a program to uh, try to teach to read and to write. It's a program for adults. It was very difficult to put this working. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it took uh, months, years, and for somebody to uh, uh, acquire to write uh, a small uh, right, word. Right. Then, uh, wouldn't would that be? related this, to some degree the prun pruning of synapses because you're not using yeah. synapses for I language? I'd like to, to, to put in, uh, in your comments about psychological recovery, plasticity in psychological recovery, to hear our the psychiatrist uh, on this. Plasticity and psychological recovery. Um, you're addressing that to whom? Were you addressing that as a question? Yes. Doctor... Uh, what, what, what I can say is, is that uh, the, the type of sti uh, stimulus, uh, stimulation, is very important in uh, the result you get as far as neurogenesis and synaptogenesis. We talked about the different windows of opportunity. Uh, uh, we talked about the different windows of opportunity and the type of uh, enrich, uh, uh, enriched environment or the type of stimulation is very important. Like in, in one experiment, uh, the, the comparison of regular activity versus swimming versus running versus an enriched environment, the effect of neurogenesis was different. And huh. in, in some stimulations, the, uh, in some forms uh, of stimulation, for example, the runner mouse seemed to have neurogenesis earlier, but the enriched environment caught up later, whereas, uh -huh. uh, and they both did better than the others. So, the, uh, and this, we are understanding better in animals. We need to translate that to the types of studies that you have mentioned and uh, you have done, and to understand what is working for which uh, uh, function, in which population, at what age, and uh, then we will be able to design uh, uh, interventions that are uh, uh, hopefully more effective. Okay. Yes. Um, picking up on that, we're another way to kind of, in a sense, refine or at least add to the comments that you made is that we tend to see the world very mechanistically. We do an intervention, we have an outcome. And what we seem to forget is what's in between the intervention and the outcome, and that happens to be the organism. <laughs> and the organism can be in a variety of states, and that's really what this whole model I was presenting is based upon the physiological state of the organism and the feedback from the physiological state to the brainstem. It's opening up different portals to make interventions more or less, less efficient. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
so again, it goes back to this issue of what you're both talking about is trying to uh, map what's going on in the brain in time. So it's kind of moving target, and, uh, and it's complex and difficult. I, I did want to, you know, some of the things that uh, you were talking about, about safety, uh, doesn't that relate to, to some of the things we were talking about earlier with regard to breastfeeding? I mean, that it's not simply a, a matter of mother's milk, but it's also the interaction between a mother and baby and all those sorts of... I mean, certainly we know, we know that breastfeeding is affected by a whole slew of issues that relate to maternal mental health, the environment, the supportive environment I talked a little bit about. Uh, the, the social structures that facilitate or impede breastfeeding practices. Uh, but I think uh, one of the issues that I do want to react to is, is stress and toxic stress. So I, I was quite distressed to see the video this morning from Syria. Uh, you know, remember that Syria is not the first conflict in the world that's affected children. I happen to come from a geography where uh, in, in Afghanistan and in border areas of Pakistan, children have seen nothing but conflict for the last a whole generation, has seen nothing but conflict for well over 35, 40 years. My first experience as a pediatrician was in a refugee camp way back in the 70s. And if you just look back and see what has happened to a whole generation that has grown up in that environment, you can very clearly see the impact of a toxic environment in certain circumstances, and clearly a lot of resilience and social protection factors which are a huge natural experiment. So we find that in certain areas, families and communities have got together to provide the kind of social support and structures that are needed for children to grow in the same environment. And in others, they have failed because the level of conflict and exposure has been to the extent that a whole generation has been inured to the nature of violence and conflict of the kind that you were listening to this morning. So, so I think, yes, of course, what's been spoken about in terms of stresses and uh, resilience and response clearly relates to the state of the individual, the family, the community. But where we need to get in without necessarily spending the next 50 years on only doing the research is what can we do to implement some of those protective factors today. Right. And breastfeeding and breastfeeding support is clearly one area where a lot more can be done than is being done at the moment. Um, that needs to relate to the kind of social protective mechanisms that we have around supporting this, reducing some of the threats, the environment, the the breastfeeding protection that needs to happen in a particular circumstance, but also importantly, the health, nutrition, and education of the person who is going to breastfeed. Right. Uh, I, I think it is, to me, unacceptable to have, as I mentioned, a level of malnutrition in the mothers, and yet the only thing that you hit the poor woman on her head with is you have to breastfeed. And nothing, nothing is done in terms of that context. And I've seen that time and time again in the environments that I'm referring to. So it's probably time now to put some of these interventions that don't necessarily just stop with breastfeeding. They also relate to the very important orphan issue of complementary feeding in food insecure populations that we have done nothing about. And that's a huge impact that continues well after six months and probably is is something for the agencies to put their attention towards. Well, it, it, it just reinforces everything is so connected. A, a couple quick points on that. Breastfeeding in itself is a neural exercise for the infant. So the utilization of the muscles of the face are part of a neural feedback loop that helps the baby regulate visceral state. And it supports digestion. Um, and it also is actually an exercise of the same neural circuits that are used for social behavior and for state regulation for resilience. However, your point is really good. Not everyone can do this, but the psychoeducational component is really, there are two parts. It's not merely the neural exercise, the stimulus response. It's creating the safe environment for the infant and for the mother so that the physiology of the two are now in a more optimal state for health, growth, and restoration. Right, and then good things follow. Right. right. So in a, in a recent exercise, 
uh, a big project that's just about to come out in the Lancet. You know, we tried at scale in rural Pakistan, one of my colleagues, Asha, Aisha Yusufzai, to do this large cluster randomized trial of, of working with public sector community health workers for promoting infant and young child nutrition, including breastfeeding, at scale in villages in a very poor rural population. And the fascinating thing that we see in this food insecure and poor population is that even though you may not have seen overt nutritional benefits, such as, for example, massive reductions in stunting or micronutrient deficiencies. But at 24 months of age, the differences that we are beginning to see in neurocognitive behavior in the intervention group are massive, huge differences, which also makes the case that we should not be defining some of these outcomes of interventions through a very narrow, lens of anthropometry or nutritional benefits as we understand that. Mm -hmm. I mean, our biomarkers on some of these functional outcomes are inexact. But if you take the whole thing together to say, are these kids better off in terms of their neurodevelopmental outcomes, their language skills, their school preparedness at, at, uh, at that age, clearly there is a huge benefit of integrating child stimulation mm -hmm. with nutrition, the care for development package that is easier to implement. Fascinating. It's all I'd like to just make one final bit. And there's even a more primitive, simpler behavioral outcome. Can the child regulate their behavior? Ah. And of course, right. you know, that's assumed if they are doing better than these others. But merely targeting that, because if you ask families, what are the, or teachers, or any, the problems are if the child can, behavior can't be regulated. Because that's when you start seeing aggressive, obsessive, everything is out all, of control. All of the other issues. Yeah. Well, okay, I think now we can open up to questions from the audience. Chuck? That? Great question. I'm wondering if you could define what an enriched environment would look like for the human. Who wants to start with that one? What, what, the, is what is an enriched environment? How would you define it for a human? For television <laughs> 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 I'll try. Uh, yeah, go, yes. go for it. Okay, so in my modeling, an enriched environment is an environment in which there's face-to-face -face social interaction among conspecifics. Okay. Well, then there is no enriched. It's the expected. Okay. And, and I think, again, if we start exploring the literature, we would start finding out that uh, the major findings are in deprivation, not in enrichment. So we're trying to optimize the organism but there are other points related to what you're saying, and that is the plasticity and the flexibility. And even using the word optimize, we're optimizing for a social individual, which may be minimizing for an aggressive warrior. Can I? <laughs> My spoon. Uh, a rich environment uh, in these very early ages, I think it's, uh, I, I, I gave you, I give you an example, is, uh, uh, saying to the parents and to the mother that uh, the child, a uh, newborn, is a uh, human dependent. If, if this baby he, he is not fed, he will die. Then, and the feeling of this child is, uh, uh, is something stressful for him. Then, when the mother comes and do the, 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 the breastfeeding, it's not, not only the milk, but the holding, giving protection, giving affection. And when when uh, we talk about uh, enrichment of the environment, it, it's not with uh, lights and music and other things, it's affection. Is trying to tell the parents uh, how important they are, how important is the father, uh, a father to 
support the modern society in all mm -hmm. her uh, insecurity during this period. And uh, you can uh, have all this evidence when during, and this is a practical thing, uh, when, uh, when, you, uh, when the, the, the pregnant woman come to the, came to, 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 the, to the consultant, uh, the, obst the obstetrician uses to see her weight. Mm -hmm. uh, if the tummy is uh, bigger, mm -hmm. right. but he doesn't, uh, uh, the, he doesn't uh, do any question about her feelings. If she is feeling well, if she likes to be pregnant, mm -hmm. if she is afraid with her husband, is right. how he is looking on her body, and all this uh, brings anxiety to the mother. And after birth, as well, you know, giving uh, birth to a, birth to a child is an old thing, but even that mother, they, uh, they feel all this anxiety. Right. Uh, right. So you have to look at the whole picture. Yeah, then, you can't just look yeah, at one And thing. they have to, ha to, 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 to have who, somebody to give the space to talk about this. It's not a psychiatrist, right. 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 but only the, the pediatrician or uh, somebody who uh, take care of the child in the first year of life when the child has to go monthly to see the pediatrician, right. he has to get time to leave parents to say what they are feeling. Sure. This is, in, in my opinion, what we uh, can do to enrich the environment, but because this is what the child needs. So it's one, so it becomes one of those things that we have to try to tackle on the ground, but that's a, a whole nother ball game there. I wanted yes. to one follow up on Chuck's point and on yours. We live in an environment where we think enriched environments are giving people iPads. And they're doing it, I, we watched on TV where they gave them to a, a first grade class and they were very proud, but all the kids were looked, locked into looking at the iPad and not interacting with other human beings at a critical point in development. And we're very confused by the word social networking and things like that when our bodies require this interaction, the points that you were making, and our bodies require reciprocal synchronous, in real time interactions, and we often call this play. And when we have difficulty playing with people, it's because they become non-reciprocal. They turn away from us or they bump us or hurt us. And so the issue is our bodies are requesting this and we need this, and we have to understand that that is the true enriched environment. It's not the replacement with technology or music or iPads or iPhones or cell phones. Uh, we need to human interaction, and that can be delivered on the ground anywhere. True. True. Sue? Okay. Uh, nature covered some of the issues that you brought up. The a woman who is lactating is in a physiologically totally different state than one who is not. And there's not too much research on this. When I, our first son was born in 1980, I was looking around trying to find information on what happens to the mother. She's left out the equation, but nature has her in it. So if a woman is breastfeeding, she has less reactivity to stressors, even exercise. She has a better tuned immune system. She is less anxious. Everything you're asking for is there, but there's a catch. If the woman does not feed her baby at night, even if she's nursing the baby in the daytime, the cycles will return, and she's actually in a conflicted situation physiologically because the body is trying to gear up to have another baby at the same time that it's trying to nurse the original one. And this I found out for myself, there is a literature on this, but it turns out that, and this gets to this issue of working women. If women understood that their physiology was regulated most powerfully at night 
by contact with the baby, they would be spending more time with that baby at night instead of trying to switch over. So the Western culture is quickly to shift from the baby being allowed to wake up at night yes. because it's, it gets in the way. But if you sleep with the baby, they, they actually know how to nurse without any, waking you up. Any waking you up. And you have this just beautifully adapted system, which in some cultures can last for four years, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly easily for two years. This gives you birth spacing, so you immediately take another burden off of the, you know, off of the system. But mm -hmm. the mother's side of lactation, which I should have mentioned earlier, has just received almost no attention. And it's critical to all this enriching and context and sociality and synchrony that we're talking about. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're almost uh, out of time. And so what I'd like to do is, this would be the first chance that I have to ask panelists to kind of sum up their thoughts uh, one at a time. So um, would you like to start, Molly? Well, uh, I'd like to uh, give the analogy of where we are now with uh, where uh, we have been in uh, the issue of vaccines. Uh, we need uh, more basic science to get uh, better vaccines and to create new vaccines. We need targeted clinical studies where uh, we can see which vaccines are effective, which ones are not, and uh, uh, how to implement them. And uh, we need, uh, we know a lot about, the, about vaccines that are already available that we can use and we need major uh, worldwide programs in order to vaccinate. And with this, with the development, we are kind of in a similar place. We, we know a lot about basic science, but we need more to, in order to be able to look for these windows of opportunities based on the mechanisms. And I try to show the, those windows of opportunity. We need more targeted uh, clinical studies that will tell us which interventions are more effective at which time in order to better design future interventions. But we already know a lot. And um, as Dr. Buta mentioned, there is a lot that we can do with universal programs that we can apply. Thank you. Our nervous system evolved and functions in a hierarchical way. So not all areas of the brain, not all areas of the nervous system are accessible in the same way. Once we appreciate the hierarchical nature, especially of the autonomic nervous system, we can downregulate defensive responses. When those defensive systems are downregulated, we have portals to enter, to stimulate, to enhance social behavior and cognitive development. So my basic bottom line here is, a greater emphasis on an understanding of how bodily physiological state is a regulator and is regulated by the brain. This is not an original idea. Walter Hess got a Nobel Prize for statements like this in 1949. They somehow have been forgotten. So I, I think probably we may have difficulties defining what an enriched environment is but we might be more successful in underscoring what a non-enriched environment is based on what we know. So of the many, many things that create a non-enriched environment, in our experience, in this whole interaction of the mother, baby, infant, uh, in, uh, nutrition and rearing, a virtually ignored area is that of mental health. We recognize now that at least in our environment, Empowerment, empowerment of women and families in terms of addressing their own health and nutrition needs and that of their children is a critical element. And if you have that, you provide the kind of a security umbrella around which the mother is able to determine what she needs to do with her baby and her infant. In many of these circumstances, that empowerment is also linked to the whole issue of not just domestic violence, but whole regulation around how, how women are able to regulate their nutrition in intake, their work, and, and particularly work during pregnancy and lactation. So I think what we need moving forwards is perhaps to try an incremental approach of trying to optimize some of those critical time windows around pre-pregnancy period, during pregnancy, childbirth, and beyond in terms of how to optimize those interactions that we know about. And then see 
what we can do about integrating early child stimulation with early child nutrition programs. That's the low-hanging fruit that we can aim for in the next few years. Thank you. Uh, That's all. A minute. Uh, so, uh, we, in, in the rational, we found this. Uh, if we expose our brains to enrichment, they will be enriched. Uh, it, it would sound, if you offer positive or good stimulation, you would be successful, successful. But good stimulation is not only pleasure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The presence or participation of negative situations yes. within certain limits are also beneficial to brain development. Dealing with frustration, frustrations brings the experience that the child cannot do all what he wants, cannot have all what he desires, has to be patient and learn to wait. And at the time the child assimilates this, the brain develops import, develops important correspondent neuronal circuits, mm -hmm. preparing him for life, to learn at the school, to live in social and professional realities. Right, right. And I think that's a very good point. I mean. Our children also have to learn to take care of themselves and to deal with the normal stress in life as well as, I mean, they can't get everything they want all the time and be perfectly, you know, protected. Well, okay, uh, that wraps us up and we're actually almost on time. So then we'll take a short break and everyone come back and we'll do panel four. Thank you.